a blackboard talk on set theory and algebraic topology. Thank you very much, Benedict. And let me say thank you to you and the other organizers. It's been a great week. It's been a great four months or so. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, giving this talk here. Uh, so my title was Set Theory and Algebraic Topology. That was the title I gave a couple of months ago. Uh, I want to focus in on set theory and not theory. So that's what this will be all about. Uh, but not so uh, fairly closely related to algebraic topology, so I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, so this is all joint work with Sheila Miller. And it's about how complex are the invariants that we have for knots. So let me start by clarifying what do we mean by a knot. So the first definition would be that a knot is the homeomorphic image of the unit circle in R3. OK? Uh, often you'll see people, instead of R3, using the three-sphere. It's one-point compactification. For our purposes, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, and then, of course, there's the notion of two knots are equivalent. If you can kind of squoosh them around to be the same or squoosh around the ambient space. So the, uh, the definition is two knots are equivalent if uh, two knots k1, k2 are equivalent if there is an ambient isotopy uh, taking K1 to K2. What does ambient isotopy mean? That means um, there's a deformation of the space that's homotopic to just the identity, uh, where each sort of slice of that homotopy is a homeomorphism. So uh, the details don't matter for our purposes. Just think of it as the natural idea of two knots being the same up to squishing them, deforming the pieces of rope. OK, so that's, that's a nice, reasonable definition of a knot, you would think. But you can get some pretty pathological things going on with that. For example, you could have something like this, where you've got a trefoil knot followed by a trefoil knot followed by a trefoil knot sort of shrinking down shrinking down continuously to some point and then connected around. So you have infinitely much knotting there. And that fits with this definition. So that's bad. That's not what we really want to deal with when we talk about knots. So what we actually want to deal with is, oh, so before I say what we actually want to deal with, there's another reason why for my talk, dealing with things that general is bad, and that's because somebody else has already dealt with that. So it's a theorem of Kulikov from this year, or at least appeared on the archive this year. So uh, knots are not classifiable. by countable structures. So uh, Vadim already showed that if you allow these kind of wild knots uh, around, then yes, this is an incredibly horrible thing to deal with. So we're going to be interested in tame knots, which is more your intuition for knots for sort of finite things. So uh, definition, uh, 
a tame knot is one isomorphic, uh, sorry, equivalent <coughs> to the piecewise linear image of a polygon. So you just you take your rope and you just have finitely many straight edges and that's that's the kind of knots you're interested in. So that's tame knots uh, and so there's kind of a, a earlier converse to Kulikov's theorem is that uh, due to Joyce, I think a paper of 82, that tame knots are classifiable. by countable structures. Specifically, quandals. OK, so we've got this class of objects, the quandals, as algebraic objects, I'll tell you in just a moment what they are, and there's a way of associating a quandal to any tame knot in such a way that if two knots are equivalent, then the corresponding quandals are isomorphic. Okay, so also the um, yes, yes, it's a complete invariant. Also the converse. That's right. So yes, because it's a complete invariant. You might think everyone would be happy about this, but the knot theorists say, well, these quandal things, telling whether two of them are isomorphic is, seems to be a difficult problem. We can't seem to do it in a nice way. So then the question is, OK, how complex is this isomorphic isomorphism relation of quandals? And so that's what Sheila and I have uh, been working on, and we've shown that actually it's as complicated as it could possibly be. So uh, let me go on to some definitions, and in particular of quandals. So. OK, so we're going to be considering a set with a binary relation. Uh, sorry, a binary operation. Uh, so A star. OK, so I'm going to give you a series of structures, each refining the previous one. Um, so the first of these is left distributive algebras. Um, a left distributive algebra uh, is one satisfying the left distributive law um, I'll number that one let me write them over here so I don't erase them and that's just that a star b star c equals a star b star a star c. OK, so that's for all a, for all b, for all c. OK, so this distributivity over itself, that might 
feel like an unusual algebraic axiom to deal with, but actually there are a few examples of these sorts of things around. Uh, so the first case is if you take a group with a conjugation operation. So, uh, EGs. So we have a group, and then star is conjugation. So A star B is uh, A B A inverse. Then you can check, very simple algebra, that this holds for your group with that operation. Another nice example is if you have a Boolean algebra. And A star B is your implication operation. Just A implies B. Then if you take this, put an implication operation there, check with truth tables, you'll find that that works. Um, and another example, which is how Sheila and I got into thinking about all of this stuff, is from very strong large cardinals, rank-to-rank -rank embeddings. So if you have a, a rank to rank, so this is I3 in the table in the back of Kanemori's book, right at the top. If you have an elementary embedding, J from V lambda to V lambda for some limit lambda, and you have another one, K, you can define J star K to be J essentially applied to K. Now K is too big to be in the domain of J, but what you can do is take J of K restricted to V alpha and union that over alpha less than lambda. And it turns out if you do that, you get another rank-to-rank uh, -rank embedding from V lambda to V lambda. And it's easy to check that by elementarity, this is again a left distributive operation. Yes? So, uh, implies, or not A or B. <coughs> so that's another example of this, and in fact, Lever showed that uh, if you take a single rank-to-rank -rank embedding with this operation and just generate algebraically, you actually get the free left distributive algebra on one generator. So that's, a, uh, that's how you might have heard about these uh, weird results where you use this very strong large cardinal axiom, a rank-to-rank -rank embedding, and you get finitary results out, it's because they're results about uh, left distributive algebras that we don't know how to prove without the set theoretic machinery of that rank-to-rank -rank embedding example. Okay, so those are left distributive algebras. First axiom, so let's move on to racks. So Racks were worked on uh, here in Cambridge by Conway and Wraith when they were students here. Uh, so to understand racks, it maybe helps to have a, a slightly different perspective on left distributive algebras. So we've got this law that's a nice enough algebraic law, but one way to view it is if you take the multiply by A on the left operation, then this law is saying nothing more or less than the fact that that is a homomorphism of, uh, of your algebra. So, so if we consider MA taking B to A star B, then the left distributive law is just saying that MA is a homomorphism of your structure for every A in capital A. So then that's left distributive algebras. A rack is going to be one where each MA is an automorphism
Okay, so it's a, it's not, each MA is not just a homomorphism, it's a, a bijective one as well. So in axiom form, you can say for every A and for every C, there exists a unique B such that A star B equals C. And these two axioms together define racks for you. And you can check it very easily that this group conjugation example is still an example of a rack. All right, now on to quandals. So a quandal is a rack where uh, A is a fixed point. of MA for every A. Okay? So that's the intuitive way to say it. The axiom way to say it is very easy. It's just that A star A equals A. Idempotent, right. Yes, exactly. So a rack with idempotence is a quandal. And I want to go one step further down the rabbit hole. Ooh. Do rabbit holes have steps? Probably not. OK. And that's a K, or also called an involutory quandal. And that's a quandal where uh, each MA is an involution. Does that word mean anything? Yes, it's Japanese. <laughs> it, it can either mean an edge or it can mean a scepter, like a royal thing. Um, K's were named by Takasaki in a paper from 1943. Um, it's written in Japanese. Not only that, it's written in classical Japanese, so even Japanese people have difficulty reading it. Uh, but apparently, K means this. Um, yes, the, most of the other uh, work comes from much more recently, Quandle's, oh well, Joyce was 1980s. Quandle is his invention word, so. No, it's just a nonsense word that he felt sounded right, so. So the K's axiom is, what's it going to be? It's that A star A star B equals B. Uh. OK, so those are the axioms we're working with. Uh, let me give you a little bit of geometric intuition. Uh, first of all, if you look at groups with conjugation, then you can see, again, it's a quandle, not just a rack. And if you want an example of a K, a good example for that is if you take geometric reflections, so, again with conjugation. If you take two reflections and do them one after the other, that's a different kind of symmetry. But if you do if you have reflections A and B and you do A, B, A, then that's another reflection. And the structure of those reflections forms a K. And it was in that context that Takasaki was studying them in the 1940s. Uh, how do we get a quandle from a knot? Since I've got it up here, let me give you the gist of it. Uh, let's... All right, I didn't even practice that. Okay, so the way you get a, qu a quandle from a knot is you take, the k take a presentation on two-dimensional paper like this and label the edges. Well, sorry, label the arcs, the connected pieces. 
And then the quandle operations that you get, uh, you have to be careful about uh, the orders of things, whether things go forwards or backwards. But essentially, it's A going under B gives you C. Uh, yes, let's say yes. Right, so what I mean is as it's drawn with the gaps in, I just mean the as drawn arcs. So. It's not really a, the arc, it's the projection or diagram of. Exactly, it's the, the representation, if you like. And so. Uh, <coughs> Joyce showed that, I mean, you can define it this way, you can also define it in a more directly algebraic top topological way, and these are equivalent, and they are not invariants. But the, the kind of gist of it is that you have A going under B gives you C, and that corresponds to your quandle has three generators, A, B, and C, and then you have relations A star B is C, and this one will have also B star C equals A from uh, A under B is C, B under C is A, and C under A is B. So uh, the quandle for this knot is generated by A, B, C, with these relations. And then if you, if you look at what the quandle axioms tell you, it turns out there's a very nice correspondence. Each of these axioms corresponds exactly to one of the Rademeister moves. So you might know the Rademeister moves are ways you can, simple ways you can deform knots to uh, get two things that are presented differently to appear the same. Yes, Philip? Again, the star operation, for example, what is B star A? Uh, so the way I get it is by going around the knot, just follow it around, and so I have A coming under B gives me C. So that's that one. And then I keep going around. C coming under A gives me B. And then B coming under C gives me A. And what's B star A, for example? Then you have to, well, you take the, these are the defining relations of the quandal. So it's free unless these relations generate a relationship there. Um, so, yeah, that, that's essentially how it works. And then you have the Rademeister moves, uh, for example, this one. Um, you should have that A going under A itself is the same thing as A. And so that's exactly your idempotence. And the two other Rademeister moves correspond to the two other quandle axioms. So it's really a quite nice geometric thing. OK, so that's why we care about quandles. Uh, so now, what are we going to how are we going to show that they're as complicated as possible? Well, first of all, in what sense are they as complicated as possible? Um, probably most people in the audience have heard of Borel reducibility, but let me state it anyway. <coughs> so, uh, given two equivalence relations E and F on, let's say, the reals, uh, we say E is Borel reducible to F if there is a Borel map um, F from R to R such that 
uh, x is e equivalent to y if and only if f of x uh, is f equivalent to f of y. And we write this as e is for L less than f. Now, I said the reals. Uh, what I really mean is essentially things that can be coded up in a nice way by reals. And what we're going to be interested in, the equivalence relation is going to be isomorphism of countable structures. So isomorphism of countable quandals, isomorphism of countable graphs. And these things can all be encoded by uh, sets of finite tuples of natural numbers if you assume the underlying set is the naturals. So that can all very nicely be encoded into the reals. So we land in this framework. <coughs> so the uh, claim, where am I? <coughs> so um, we say that that a class of structures is Borel complete I guess what I mean is first order class the usual model theoretic sense of having a signature and all structures for that signature satisfying some theory so that class of structures is Borel complete if uh, the isomorphism relation of any other uh, class of structures. First Sorry? First oh, yes, first order. Thank you. Class of structures uh, Borel reduces its isomorphism relation. Okay, so there are a range of classes of structures that are Borel complete. Um, in the very first paper about this kind of stuff where the term Borel complete is introduced by Friedman and Stanley, they say that it's essentially folklore that graphs are Borel complete. Um, and also, it doesn't matter what you mean by graphs. It can be symmetric graphs, it can be directed graphs. Um, what we're going to use is irreflexive directed graphs. They're all Borel complete. Other examples include linear orders or trees. On the other hand, finitely branching trees is not Borel complete. So, um, yeah. So then our theorem. Oh, Lost track of boards a bit. Let's. Make an observation. Yeah. So the uh, orientation you have on this law. Take the opposite orientation. I'm assuming you get an isomorphic quandle. Uh, that's why I was slightly vague. Um, so, so in that sense, you don't discriminate with the quandle up to orientation. With with the with the slightly hand waving definition about the orientation definition that I gave, yes, it doesn't distinguish. But okay, there is a little bit more to it. I said A going under B, but is it B going that way or B going that way? And you have to, if you do it properly, you have to take account of which way B is. So I... So I guess I simply wanted to say that, that this, with an orientation, this knot is chiral. And therefore, the quando doesn't distinguish between chirality. So you are not just deforming the knots in Euclidean sense, you're also permitting inversion. 
Right. Um, if you well, if uh, <coughs> yes, I guess you're right. Yes. True. Okay. So there's a. Uh, you have to be careful about what you mean by equivalence of knots here. So, yes. Okay. Anyway, for quandals in particular, uh, the theorem is. So. That quandals are, uh, in fact, let me go one step further, k's are Borel complete. And of course, since k's was the kind of most refined structure of these things, we are. Uh, So we so to have that quandals and racks and LD algebras are Borel complete. Uh, left distributive. Of um, not really. It's more a case of there's um, just an assumed involutory nature to the quandle. I guess you could have k's defined for knots coming from um, if you threw into the presentation having that a star b. A star A star B equals B for all the generators. Um, oh, would that do it? Anyway, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, K nodes correspond to all finely generated quantum, right? Right. The finely many relations, so you're talking about only commonly many such things. That's right. So, from a Borel reducibility point of view, tame knots is trivial. So, showing that these things that we're using as complete invariants are Borel complete shows you that you know this is probably not optimal. Um, there you're only using finitely presented quandals as your invariant. Sorry, say again. You're only using finitely presented quandals as your invariant. Right. So that is optimal. Since uh, that's also smooth, as countably many classes. Um, but. Well, no, the point is uh, you, can, you can have, there are many, oh, right. I guess the question then is whether you can, for every finally presented uh, quantum, you can actually just uh, draw a knot because of it, then, then it is optimal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How, how could the collection of countably many, uh, class of countably many structures, how, how can that be Borel complete? So, so it's not that. So, uh, it, right, this is. Knots, but rather the derived. I've done a bit of a bait and switch. I've said we're interested in quandals because of tame knots. Now let's look at quandals. An isomorphism of quandals is what the theorem's about. But it's all quandals that the theorem is about. So. Yes. OK. You caught me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, but anyway, uh, this was um, the, the question remained of whether these things are Borel complete. And so the answer is yes, they are. And how are we going to do that? Um, Encode graphs into quandals. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a way of taking any graph and uh, constructing a quandal, uh, in particular constructing a K from it. And then because graphs are Borel complete, so are Ks, and so are quandals and racks and left distributive algebra. So how does this encoding work? Well, this relies on a result of uh, a much more recent result than all the other history I've been telling you due to Kamada. And it's about what he calls dynamical uh, quandals. Okay, so here's the construction. Suppose you have, oh, so I said it was recent. It was a 2010 paper. So suppose you have a set A with a bijection uh, tor from A to A. Okay, so Kamada thinks of this pair as a dynamical system. That's where the name's coming from. Uh, so then, uh, let's see. So call a function phi from a to the power set of a. Um, or replete if um, for each if for each a first of all a is in phi of a phi of a is closed under um, phi of a is closed under tor and its inverse and also the other way you could use tor phi of a equals phi of tor of a okay so basically this function given any member of your underlying set going to a subset, uh, it's got to be closed in every reasonable way for the bijection tor. So then the observation that Kamada made, although he set it up slightly differently, but the observation was that there's now a very Nice, simple way to define a quandle from that. From tau and phi. Right. So then, uh, so then, if uh, you have a for s above and phi. Uh, tor replete, then with a star defined by um, a star b equals just b if a is in the set corresponding to b and it's tor of b if a is not in that set, uh, then that is a quandle. Okay, 
Uh, it's actually a, a couple of these things are very simple to check. The uh, item potence, of course, is immediate. Uh, the, the second axiom there for racks is uh, just a case of uh, n noticing the sort of Tor invariance of repleteness, and then you can check the cases and left distributivity works out as well. So then uh, note also if right if uh, Tor is an involution. Then, um, then A with star is more over a K. <coughs> so, this was, uh, so this is the main tool that we use. So how do we use it? Well, we've got this wonderful function to the power set there. That's what we're going to use to encode the edge relation. So I don't want to drag on too much longer, so let me just give you the gist of what we do. So then the idea is encode uh, the edge relation into uh, phi and just have tor, just kind of tautological. So how's it going to work? Given, let me write that down. So given a graph G vertex set and edge set, then you can define the K or the quandal for G uh, with underlying set V times 2. And then our Tor is just going to be the involution on the second component. And phi, so uh, u i is in v phi of v j. Well, first of all, you ignore the second component because that's what you need to do to make things tor replete. And then you just can say that holds if and only if uh, u is an edge well, u has an edge to v, or of course u equals v. So that, that's how we define a quandle from a graph. Uh, so, oh, well, that's, that's the setup. And then, of course, uh, the dynamical quandle that we get from this setup. OK, so it should be fairly clear that given two isomorphic graphs, we get isomorphic quandals. The question now is if we have, iso if we have two quandals coming from graphs, do we, ha uh, with an isomorphism between them, is there then an isomorphism of the graphs? Now, if you have no fixed points of the quandal, if, if it's never the case that A star B equals b for all a. So how do I want to phrase this? If, if b is, does not have this property, then you take something that uh, moves it with the involution, and then you can take your quandal isomorphism that must move its image, and that will define for you how you can take uh, the, the vertex corresponding to B 
to another vertex on the other side. So, all right. So final board, how we do that So, given rho from QG to QG prime, define F from G to G prime uh, on fixed points and non-fixed points on the non-fixed points case by the fact that rho is a homomorphism there's a single choice to make that you're forced on the other hand if you're a fixed point then you can make an arbitrary choice And then you can go through and check all the mixed cases, and it all works out. And you do get that isomorphism here corresponds to isomorphism of the graphs. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <coughs> Questions? Back to this question about uh, uh, <coughs> condos. So these condos that appear in the um, uh, as as in not invariants, right? Are finite presented as well. Finitely presented, yes. Yeah, there's yeah. Not actually that many. Of them. <laughs> and if you relax finite presentation, well, you still can consider condos condos uh, in general. Is there any class of nodes intermediate between these same nodes and the wild nodes uh, that would correspond to uh, that's a finitely generated but not finitely presented bundles? I that's a good question. I can imagine there would be, but I don't know off the top of my head. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, a small question about the algebra. Maybe I'm just not really saying properly. Sure. Um, so. I can see these axioms here. Um, if you have a K, the fourth axiom gets you that, that the, in the second axiom, the B is unique. Right. Um, but if it's a quandal, I don't see it following from the other ones. And you mentioned that you had a, uh, you're had you taking the quandal associated to the knot is the free, well, it's going to be the free quandal modulo of some relations. So right. How do you fix that? So maybe I'm just trying to. Sorry, I, uh, what, what do you know? How, how do you ensure uniqueness of the B? Um, or is it just happens to be in this case, in this particular example? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm so, so you always get free quandals, you say? Well, no. I, I mean, some. You, you always get quandals from okay, this okay. construction. Okay, so it's just presentation, but it wasn't, it's no such thing as a free quandal. Uh, well, I mean, of course, there's the term quandal, so there is such thing as a free quandal, but. Um, <laughs> So an, another way to express this second axiom is also you can do it with a second operation. Have like a star inverse yeah. corresponding to, well, the inverse of the multiply by A operation. Yeah. And so there, if you do use that approach, then it's purely uh, algebraic identities that you're working with. Yeah, sure. So uh, that... Oh, it's, just, it's just the uniqueness which is confusing me. Well, what I was getting at is kind of you, you can't freely generate any quandle on any set. You have a fixed set of. I, I, okay, I guess you might want to sort of uh, bring in the second operation yeah, in that yeah, case. Okay. To, yes. With the second operation, you can freely generate. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Yeah. Can you explain how these axioms correspond to the right 
So what are the Rademeister moves? I have a cheat sheet here. So you've got this in its inverse. So, so that corresponds to A going under A is A. Then you have um, Actually, even here, we'll want the, the sort of second operation that if you've got A, B, then this will be B going under A. Uh, going under A again, but with the... I've, I've waved my hands too much and haven't done the uh, directions uh, for you properly, but this becomes... B star A, sorry, uh, right, 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 if, okay, B star A, and then B star A, star A, and this is where I discover that my cheat sheet does right distributive algebras rather than left distributive algebras. Um, so equals B. So um, this Rademeister move is corresponding to that second rack axiom, and then isn't isn't that the last axiom? Uh, no, because it's this this funny second operation that you you can bring in to deal with the existential quantifier. Instead of saying there's this, you can say you have another operation star such that A star okay, okay. inverse. I see. Yeah. The, the, the B star A is actualizing your existential quantifier. Right. Right. And then the final Rademeister move, this goes down to this. Um, gosh. Uh, okay, A, B, C, A star C, B star C, A star C, again this is right distributive instead of left distributive, but of course it doesn't matter, uh, C, A, B, A star B, B star C, A star B star C. So that's how they correspond. And if you get the orientations right, which is not something I've mastered clearly, then <laughs> you can do it properly. Yeah, uh, another question following the last the last question. Hmm. Uh, you definitely have it for the for the generators. You know, if you've got the knot and hmm. does it follow that uh, if you um, you give a relation for you know for generating a quantum that uh, you? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure. What's there. Oh. Um. Shall I say something interesting that's kind of related? <laughs> uh, so um, the, the quandal axioms are actually uh, a complete full axiomatization of the equational content of the theory of graphs with conjugation. So there is, uh, I mean, it's a complete description of something nice. So any any statement, any equational statement about groups with conjugation um, is true if and only if it can be proven from the quandal axioms. So this was proven by Joyce. Um, so yeah, as for, I'm, well, I'm not quite clear what you were asking about. <laughs> any other questions? When you um, 
when you encode maybe not uh, some kind of finite graph. Right. Then uh, there's a problem of how com the complexity of it. I mean, um, I remember one result from, which is a consequence <coughs> of the graph minor theorem. Okay. It says that basically uh, if you want to test such a graph for notlessness, right. there's a cubic algorithm. Uh -huh. and nobody knows uh, this algorithm because it depends on the bad minus, and nobody knows the bad minus. I see. But anyway, so uh, is there, um, so there must be some results in complexity theory. There are. <coughs> so, <coughs> do you know anything about? So that? I know that the um, graph isomorph graph isomorph is. Uh, what am I saying? Not equivalence is decidable, but if you go up one dimension and have the equivalent of not so surfaces in force space, then that is not decidable. Um, so, yeah, again, there's a, an important distinction to be made, really, between Borel reducibility and computability. Um, but, yeah. That, not, uh, that decidability is about tame knots or full knots? That's about 10 knots, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, one of the you mentioned the surfaces in full space. Do you get quandles for those as well, or is there some harder algebraic structure? You you get racks for those at least. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. No more questions. Is this really the end? <laughs> Party time. Party time. So before we thank Andrew again, uh, let me remind you that it would be nice to to use the opportunity to thank all of the Isaac Newton Institute people during the party. So so if you could all, well not all of you because that would be a bit too much I guess, but uh, if you feel like it, if you have special moments you would like to thank them for, please thank them for whatever they have done over the last four months. And now let's close this whole program by thanking Andrew. Well, can I just propose we really close by thanking one more time the organizers.